<laughs> we're, we're delighted that you're able to join us this morning for a conversation on formation. Um, the Reverend Dr. Willie Jennings uh, with us today from Yale University. Uh, when I was in seminary some years ago, he was my academic dean. And I'm so grateful for all that I learned. Uh, he is just out with a new book called After Whiteness. And uh, when I was talking to Shane the other day about beginning October with morning prayer and a conversation on formation, I said, well, I am reading this book and it is all about formation. <laughs> so the, 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 the subtitle of the book is An Education in Belonging and your focus is certainly on theological education and uh, that has been your life's work. Uh, but formation in one context can teach us something about formation in every context, I believe. I hope so. And yeah, so, that's right. And so, uh, yeah, it's, it's a joy to get to talk to you about this. Maybe I could just begin by asking you uh, what you see as the primary challenges and obstacles to formation in the way of Jesus for people who are living in this American story at this moment in history. Yes, Lord. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, thank you both for inviting me to this wonderful program. And it's great to be in the presence of two wonderful disciples of Jesus. So thank you so much for, for the invitation. Well, I think the number one challenge we're facing is that we have a counterfeit image that's planted right in front of us hmm. that um, aims all our hopes and dreams and our aspirations for what it means to be a mature human being right now. And that is at the center of our educational endeavors, whether we're in theological school, Bible college, high school, uh, undergraduate education, graduate education. It's an image that is pulling at all of us. And the image is of a white self-sufficient man who embodies three what I call demonic virtues possession, control, and mastery. Hmm. And that image, that, that image is driving the formation energy of so much education in the West. Hmm. We who are Christians, we, Christianity helped to give life to that, helped to birth that baby. Hmm. And we are still tied so profoundly to that image. Mm. And that's the first thing that undermines discipleship because we believe that that image is what actually enables discipleship and mm. enables someone to be able to handle their power, uh, lead, yeah. and show all the necessary skills to build a world, my brothers, to build mm. a world. Mm. Now, here... I, just to clarify, I, I have benefited from uh, hearing your insight and then trying to live into it over decades now. And uh, so, 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 so to, so to kind of talk about how this hits home for a moment, let, let me just say this way. You're talking to two uh, uh, brothers who maybe more obviously were invited to live into this self-sufficient white imagination for the man. Uh, you know, I, I growing up, in North Carolina's tobacco country. I know you grew up on the chocolate side of Grand Rapids, Michigan, and, and you also were invited to live into this, right? So, mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so just to clarify, you're talking about a system that has created an image that invites everybody to live into this. How's that? Everybody, everybody, men, women, children, it doesn't matter your ethnic background, mm -hmm. um, your, your um, economic, uh, background everyone is invited into this this is this drives what it means to grow <laughs> mm -hmm. what it means to become mm -hmm. and so for so many people they are inside of it and as i've been talking to folks what they're starting to realize you know as they read this book is oh this you're starting to name the thing that has been has been aching in me the thing that's been mm -hmm. there's something that's been gnawing at me there's this deep melancholy I have had in my whole educational process that I've not been able to name, but mm. you just put your finger on it. Mm. And 
This, this process is working deeply inside institutional life, especially inside the church. Mm. 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 You know, in the book, you, um, you do a reading of this um, painting that uh, somebody found in the archives up at Wheaton, right? This yeah, painting. The Billy, the Billy Graham archives. Billy Graham archives at Wheaton. Uh, I, I wonder if you, if you would just walk folks through, you know, some of the characters in that painting, because I think in some ways it helps you see what you're talking about, kind of, and uh, in in, in where we inherited it from. It's an illustration from the London Times from 1863. Um, uh, one, of the, one of the news reporters from there was in the States covering the Civil War. And he happened upon this plantation. I don't know if he happened, but he came to this plantation in South Carolina. And like many plantations, the plantation had a chapel where the slave master and his family would gather on Sundays to worship the living God with um, his slaves. Mm. And in this particular image, they are in the chapel there in South Carolina. And at this, and it's the master, his family, and all the slaves, and then a slave preacher. But the, the way it's set up, the way he draws it, is just uh, haunting and frightening. When I saw it, it just, I had nightmares about it. Because mm. here is the master sitting at the center of the chapel all his slaves around him. He has a Bible, or it looks like a Bible, in his hands, and the Bible is closed. <laughs> the slave preacher is up in the pulpit, which is a table, a makeshift pulpit, and he's up in the pulpit, and he's got his hand up, and he's preaching. The slave master is not looking at him. He's just kind of staring off into, into, the, into space. Kind of breaking that fourth wall, if you're thinking about it, because he's looking at you, he's looking at us. Mm -hmm. And all the slaves are around him, and, and next to him is his son. Mm -hmm. and then next to his son is his daughter, and then his wife. The daughter is leaning up against the wife, kind of half asleep. But the son is sitting next to the father, and the mm -hmm. son is looking out just like the father, not, not paying attention to the sermon, just looking out. All the slaves are sitting around. They're not looking at, you know, some are looking at the preacher, but they all have this profound um, sadness and melancholy on their faces. Hmm. And they're, they're looking at the preacher, many are looking at the preacher, but many are looking at the slave master sitting there in the middle of them. And nobody looks like they are having a good time. Everybody looks like they are being forced to be in this space with hmm. this slave preacher. And so what I said in the in the book, as I said, all of theological education, all of Western education, and all of Western institutional life is haunted by this picture. Mm -hmm. uh, a slave plantation <laughs> at worship and an mm. enslaved preacher all Ooh. haunted by that mm. picture. Yes, mm. indeed. Because he's preaching the gospel mm. to these slaves and to the slave master. Mm. He's doing church, mm -hmm. and church is being done on this plantation. Mm -hmm. And so, what I said is that we are all yet caught institution in terms of institutional life, my brothers. We are all still caught yeah. in the pedagogy of the plantation. Mm. 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 And uh, in many ways, uh, one mm. of the things we see happening in the church right now is that. Um, folks are waking up to this reality in some specific circumstances. For example, uh, there are many churches where people have left over the last four years and said, I'm not listening to that gospel anymore, right? Uh, or uh, uh, other, you know, families in which the, you know, people are caught up and, you know, being torn, you know, say, I, 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 I I don't want to get rid of Jesus, but I'm not following Jesus like that anymore. I mean, I, I'm, I'm in these yeah. conversations all the time. So given, given your uh, long reflection on this, I, I wanted to invite you to help us imagine what does formation out of that formation look like, right? How, how do we begin to uh, imagine communities that are formed 
on the way to a new reality. That's right. Yeah. Well, let's let's think about it at both levels. Let's think about the formation of the the individual Christian. Let's think about the formation of the communities. Right. Well, the level of the individual Christian. What we want to do is to invite people into a different founding image, right? Mm. This image that we've been talking about is, you know, no one has to articulate that image. It's there. It's always there. It's, and it's working itself in like a cancer in our bodies. But there's another image we want to start to put on the table. And it's the image of Jesus and the crowd. Mm. Yeah, we want that image. That's right. We want the image of Jesus and a crowd. Mm. Now, the crowd isn't Christian. But the crowd is the conditions within Christianity will come to be. But Jesus and the crowd are crucial, right? And what is it about this, this, this image? Well, what this image points to is one whose life is centered in God and whose very life gathers. Mm. His very life draws people together, draws people together who would not normally want to be around each other, draws people together who hate each other, but draws people together for the possibility of conversation, breaking bread, coming to know each other, draws people together. Now, what if, if we thought about formation, the deepening of life with God, the deepening of understanding of this world, the deepening of self-understanding, shaped with that as the goal, that no matter what I'm learning, no matter what I'm doing, the goal is for me to become the kind of person mm. in the presence of God who can mm. gather people together. Wow. Come Ooh. on. <laughs> a person who just states communion by their life. Mm. They can be a nurse, they can be a doctor, they can be a plumber, they can be a teacher. But what they do, what in everything they they gather people together, people who are not, I, you know, it's just, you know, sometimes we'll talk about this in terms of somebody who has a great personality, but I want to talk about this in terms of, a, of an intentional formation yeah. of people who are able by their very life to break open boundaries and borders. Yeah. They just bring people together. People are always coming together and everything they do, it just yeah. breaks something open. People are like, okay, I want, okay. We're here again. And why are we here? Because, well, because of him and because of her. This is the way she is. She just, she just pulls the people together. You're making me think about my neighbor up here on the next block, Miss Carolyn. <laughs> when I moved here, I noticed everybody sat on her porch. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and uh, she, you know, eventually she invited us to start sitting on her porch. And then when our kids, when our kids came along, you know, they came to the porch, they they learned that Miss Kelly had a little candy dish over there by her chair, right? So so they wanted to be there. I mean, all the people that want to be on that porch, there's some gathering happening there. Yeah. Listen, this is what we want. And we want we want to ask ourselves some some of the bigger uh, theoretical questions about it, pedagogical questions about it. What is it about, not simply Sister Karen, but what it is about her her life practice, her way of being in the world? that is able to always see the possibilities and enact the possibilities mm. of bringing together, right? Now, so if we think about that reality at the heart of our formation, then what happens is we start to break down a Christian formation that is still indebted to these demonic virtues, mm. still indebted to control, and mastery and possession, how smart you are, how much you know, how, how you're able to control and manipulate and run things. We start to break down all of that that is, that is like a cancer inside of Christian formation, right? Mm -hmm. So much Christian formation is still tied to a sick performance of this white self-sufficient masculinity. Yeah, that's right. right? So much of the discipleship, when it, when we get done with it, is already tailor made to creating a certain kind of vision of leadership, a certain kind of vision of of power, a certain kind of vision of control. And in that mm. regard, who wants that? Mm. Mm. I mean, now there are some people who want it. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. But anybody who's trying to discern the life of Jesus, you're not going to discern the life of Jesus in that. Mm. What you're going to discern. 
is the possibility of becoming a master, a slave master. That's the pedagogy of the plantation. Mm. Mm. You, yeah, you're boy. learning all these things mm. so that you might exercise power. As I've said in many contexts, there are, there are unfortunately many Christians, they don't worship Jesus. They worship Jesus's power. Mm. Wow. And so their formation is not toward Jesus. Their formation is toward having Jesus's power. Mm. Mm. That's what they want. Mm. Forget Jesus, but I do want the power. <laughs> now, and if acting like him is going to get me the power, I'm going to listen to you all day. <laughs> <laughs> because you are a means to an end. Mm. And your program is, an, is a means to an end. Mm. Power. And unfortunately, too many people in the church, in the academy, outside the church, outside the academy, they, they are still tied to this, this sick formation. So at the level of the individual, what we need is to change that reality so that at the end, what you're aiming for is not power, especially not power over people, but power to gather people. Mm. But now at the level of the community, we are, we are right there already. Mm. We're already at the, the level of the community, the formation of a community. And that is a formation toward a group of people who by their very life already, already offers, already starts to signal, already starts to sound into the world a life together. That means whether, whether you want to call it church or not, whether you're turned off by church or not, what happens is that this, this reality, this rhythm, this sound, this feel gets into you. Yeah. And so the gathering isn't the, the gathering isn't by rote. The gathering isn't by intimidation or fear. The gathering is because the desire to gather is already at work in you. Mm. This is my oh. this is my word mm. for so many people who are who are turned on by the church is that what they're often denying for themselves or denying to themselves is the desire to gather that God is trying to instill, trying to cultivate in them, that they need one another and yeah. that that need already has salvific reality to it. I mean, it already has a saving, redempting reality to it for me to want to be in your presence to share in your life and you to share in my life. And so what we need is a formation at the level of the community that starts to build desire. That's what we need. That's what we need. So good. So good. I was thinking uh, uh, as you were sharing about that, that part, part of our concern, I think, for, for so many of us is there's a lot of folks that are leaving white evangelicalism, but they're not going anywhere. Right. You know, they're deconstructing something, but they're not reconstructing something right. new. And uh, right. that, that's what you're calling us to, you know, right. and, 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 right. and uh, right. for a right. lot of people, right. I think leaving white Trump evangelicalism isn't the end of their faith. It's the beginning. Right? It's, right. it's a starting point. They're going to find something new and beautiful on somebody's porch or Absolutely. somebody Absolutely. else's worship space. Yeah. And that's what we want. That's what we want. We want, we want people in, a, I'm, I'm like you to both of you. I'm meeting so many young disaffected folks, especially young white folks who are like, I don't want to be like grandma, grandpa. I don't want to be like mom and dad. I love them, but good Lord, I don't want their faith. And I say, okay, I got you. I'm with you. But now let, let's also be clear to want God. <laughs> yeah is to be placed inside what God wants and is being placed inside what God wants that, that's going to bring beautiful complication to your life mm. because what God wants <laughs> is for you to want oftentimes the very people you're trying to get away from <laughs> and what God wants is for you to enter fully into this reality that I've been talking about, this reality of a God that is gathering a crowd. Mm. And crowds can't be controlled. That's the beauty. Yeah, that sounds messy. That sounds <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Crowds can't be controlled because you don't know who's in that crowd. Mm. You don't know what they're packing. <laughs> you, you, you don't know where they, where they just came from. Mm. You, know, so, you know, they don't smell too good. I mean, it, it, crowds are not controllable. 
And God is aiming your life to live in the midst of an uncontrollable crowd. Mm. And that that's, you see, that's, that's the thing that's so important that we have to put on the table for so many people who are trying to reconstruct their spiritual life, their spiritual subjectivity away from evangelicalism. They still are thinking inside of control. Mm. I can't control that messy Trump reality, so I'm getting out of it. Yeah, but, oh, that's a but good you one. Can't, but you can't, you can't create a new reality that you control either, because if you try to create one that you control, you know that's that kind of boutique Christianity, that kind of boutique spirituality. That's just <laughs> another very variation of the very thing you just left. It's a, you know, you know, boutique spirituality is is the same reality as white self sufficient masculine masculinist Christianity. Mm-hmm. It's just boutique. You know, the corner from the coffee shop. Yeah, I got you. Right. I mean, come on. I mean, so at the end of the day, you still are in the game of the self-sufficient white masculine form. You're still in the same game, mm-hmm. but you're just not. You're just not inside that big old Baptist church in Texas or wherever you are. You're not inside that big old, big old Pentecostal church in Florida, but you're still inside the same. The same. Mm. I love uh, <laughs> the way you talked about fragments in this book. And in some ways, I think that helps us be clear-eyed about what we're actually dealing with. Lay out your three fragments. I think that's real helpful. We're always dealing with fragments. We're always dealing with fragments. And, and that's, that, that, that's, that's the beauty of it. And, and I, and I do, do that in the opening chapter to try to help so many people situate themselves hmm. in what they're doing, especially those who are, of us who are teachers of any sort. So we're inside, three, we're inside three kinds of fragments. The first fragment is what I call the theological fragment. And what is that? is that everything we get in the gospel, everything we get in this Christian life is in pieces. It's in slices, it's in shards, it's in, it's in, it's in little fragments. We, we don't have every word that Jesus said. We don't have everything that Paul said. We don't have everything that Peter did, you know, Monday through Sunday. <laughs> we, don't have, we don't have it, we just have pieces. Hmm. We don't have everything that any of the early church writers did. We don't have full picture of their life. We have pieces, little pieces. But in truth, that's the way it should be. Because what God does is to take those fragments Mm. and bring those fragments to us so that we as a group project can learn to work with those fragments. It's like a group of women sitting around getting ready to do a quilt. She's got a few pieces, I've got a few pieces. And together we start to quilt the life of faith together. And it's so important to understand it as a shared project of learning with the pieces because the Holy Spirit always works with the pieces, right? It's like, it's like that wonderful, it's like that wonderful story in the gospel where Jesus says after he had fed the 5,000, gather what remains. And what, was, what, what, what remained? Fragments, fragments, mm. pieces. We work with the pieces. So that's the first fragment we have to work with. But then there's a second fragment. And most people in education, whether they're in churches or in seminaries, they ignore the second fragment. The second fragment, well, this fragment is good and holy and right. The second fragment is inside the horror of slavery and colonialism. It's the shattering of people's cultures, the shattering of people's stories, the shattering of people's lives the destruction of practices, the destructions of rituals, the destruction of wisdoms, the tearing it apart, the the leaving of just a few pieces. And for so many peoples on this planet, they are in the desperate work of trying to gather the fragments that remain. How do I honor the ancestors? How do I honor what my people were and what they tried to teach me when so much of it was torn to pieces, Some, some of it destroyed, some of it I was forced to throw away so much, so much of it I was um, given in such crumbled, distorted ways. And so the folks are working really hard to try, try to recover the fragments. The problem is that it was Christians that started this mess. And many Christians refused to take their responsibility in helping pull the fragments, gathering the fragments that remain. Because those fragments that remain must be joined to the fragments that have been given. Mm. And those fragments that remain 
help to create the possibilities of deeper life together, deeper communion. When those who are doing this second fragment work recognize that those who are also doing this first fragment work, that we are the same people who are gathered together to do this important work of, of, of remembering, of holding, of thinking together, of, of connecting dots because things are missing. That's so beautiful. But then there's a third fragment that together we have to stand against. That's the, commod that's the commodification fragment, the commodity fragment. This is what so many people around the world, so many people of color live with every day, that our lives are increasingly turned into commodity. Mm. Things are being forced inside the exchange network of life mm. so that ideas, hopes, dreams, song, ritual are getting price tags put on them and being sold. And so many people are finding themselves in the horrible position of imagining their entire life, all their expressions inside this commodity chain, which brings the, the crucial question to everybody. What can I of myself sell in order to survive? Mm. And so much education, so much education is caught up in this commodity chain. And what happens? So when education is caught up in the commodity chain, the work of education to build community is fundamentally undermined. Why? Because it's caught up in the commodity chain. Mm -hmm. It's about what can be codified, commodified, sold, and a profit made. Mm. And so many institutions have become merchants, mm. merchants of lives. And so that, that fragment, we have to war against because that fragment mm. constantly undermines the possibility of community. Mm. That fragment mm. destroys at the site where life ought to be. So let me just let me give an example. So think about church music. Think about the reality of church music in so many places. Instead of it actually being the site of gathering people mm. in so many places, it's where people are warring, struggling against the constant commodification of every little word, song, dance, move that comes out of people's mouths, especially people of color. Mm. And it's horrible. And for so many people, they are, they are utterly jaded, utterly cynical of the church because they have lived their whole life, especially as musicians and so forth, mm. inside the constant commodification of everything that comes out their mouth. Mm. So these three fragments Ooh. are what we are inside of. This is the work we have to do to build community. Mm. Ooh. That's some powerful stuff. Got the fire coming this morning, it ain't even 10 o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, for folks that are that are joining us, if you if you just tuned in or if you're watching this afterwards, this is our brother, uh, Dr. Willie Jennings, and he's his book. I haven't read it yet, but I'm going to get it. Is uh, after whiteness, and I'm really excited uh, to to read your new book, and so thankful for all your other work, brother. It's great to be together, and we're you know as we're talking. Uh, this morning, it's very clear that a lot of Christians have been shaped more by whiteness than by Christ and by the community. And so what, what does it mean to think about the crisis of formation that this current era is revealing to us? It's, it's a gift to be with you, brother. Thank you for yeah. taking some time. I don't know, Jonathan, you want to... I want to ask this else you wanna ask? Yeah. as we close up one final question, which is in the midst of all this because I so value and trust your vision. I just wanted to ask for myself and for everyone who's on with us here, where do you see hope in this moment? Ooh, I, see it, I see it in so many places. You know, um, we are in the midst of a, of a horrific political and social moment, mm -hmm. but I am seeing people for the first time actually thinking about whiteness. And I am seeing people, folks of color for the first time, 
allowing their tears and their anguish to be shown. They've always had it, but they're allowing it to be shown. And, and they are refusing to be patient anymore with hiding their tears, their anguish, and their frustration with their Christian sisters and brothers. I mean, it's like it's like a family finally, finally talking about what's really going on in the family. And so I have great hope mm. because in the midst of this struggle and this turmoil, I see people listening who have not listened deeply before. Mm. Now, mm. nothing has changed yet, but everything has changed because people are listening, listening deeply like they never listened before. I was talking to one, one uh, president of a school. He said he has a friend who in just the last couple of months has re read like 15 books on, on race. <laughs> and he was afraid the guy was just going, afraid the guy was just going to pass out from despair. <laughs> I said, that's so wonderful. But, but, but what's beautiful about that is now, you know, as, as, as you both know, in, in, in scripture, there, there is that passage that um, is in the Old Testament, but Jesus repeats it in the New Testament and said, um, my people have ears, but they do not hear. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you realize the melancholy in God when God says that my people have mm -hmm. ears, but they do not hear. Mm -hmm. And so just to hear is already a sign of redemption at work. You are finally hearing. Mm. hearing. And, you know, God, our God is rejoicing because you are finally hearing. You finally got your ears open. Oh, I don't, and, you know, I don't know if it's that same, if it's that same part, brother, but when he says, uh, uh, I don't know what I'm going to do with this generation because I play the dirge and you do not cry and I play right. the flute and you will not dance. It's like right. you don't feel right. anything and people right. are starting to, they're starting to weep. They're starting to dance. They're starting yeah. to dream. That's what that that's that's the hope right there. The hope is that people that their their senses are finally opening and they're becoming attuned to the struggle, right? Mm. So there's there's hope there, my brother. There's hope. Now, of course, the challenge is to keep the mirrors open, keep those senses open. But the fact that it's happening, my dear brothers, whoa. Mm. Mm. Just for a long time. That's good. That's good. Amen. Well, Amen. thank you for that word. Thank you for this book, and thank you for my pleasure. My pleasure. <laughs> the gift of who you are, man. Thank this you, my brother. Pleasure. This I'll... Jesus who's gathering a strange crowd. <laughs> uh, listen, listen. Always good to be with my brothers. Yeah, keep up the good work, gentlemen. Fight the good fight of faith, and don't get weary. <laughs> thank you, brother. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Blessings. All, All right, right, everybody, we're going to tune out for this time. Uh, it's been a gift to have uh, Willie Jennings with us and um, read his book, After Whiteness, follow all his other work. We'll see y'all next month. We're going to do this at the first day of every month, 9 o'clock. So thanks for joining this morning. Have a great day and have a great month of October. We'll see.